<laughs> Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> I will cherish that introduction because it's highly unlikely I will never have one like that again. <laughs> Um, but thank you everyone for coming and thank you to Christoph and Helmut and the staff for hosting me here and um, thank you to the fellows for being friendly and interesting and always willing to have parties and drink lots of alcohol. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about a wetlands in the dry interior, interior of Australia, but not yet. Uh, when I was preparing this talk, I was emailing my brother and he said, are you going to talk a little bit about Australia first? like?" where it is. And I said, everyone knows where Australia is. And he said, don't you remember this TV show? So there's a, I'm going to show a little video here. Look, I know a lot of people give Americans a bum rap for knowing nothing about the world, but the reality couldn't be further from the truth. As I discovered on the streets here, asking US locals about the very world their country runs. Um, in terms of the war on terror, who do you think should be the next country to invade? Saudi Arabia. Who's somebody in the Middle East? Iran. Iran? Okay. Oh, do you want to put a, put a number one in Iran there? So it's a big country. That's that's Germany in the middle. It you know it looks like a, about the size of a large cattle station. So it's about the size of the U.S. without Alaska. But the population is only about 22 million, and the people live around the edges where those red dots are. Or to put it another way, two percent of the population lives in that yellow area. And um, you know why? It's because most of it is desert or semi-arid. Uh, after Mongolia and Namibia, it's the uh, most sparsely settled country. <laughs> uh, it's also uh, the driest inhabited continent. So these are the largest rivers in each continent. I did Eurasia together. Um, but you see the Murray River in Australia, that's our biggest river. It's uh, about 4% of the flow of the next river, which is the Mississippi. And uh, it's also the flattest continent. And so we have very poor soils and we have a really high evaporation rate. So these are the continents compared um, according to their annual average river flows. So Australia is right down the, right down the bottom. So all of that is to say that water in Australia is very important. Um, I want to, water is going to be a large part of this talk, but I want to show you some pictures of Australia because it's the, uh, it's winter here, <laughs> but in, in Australia it is summer, in Sydney it's about 30 degrees, yes, <laughs> you're sighing, <laughs> everyone, everyone is at the beach, this is how all Australians live, especially at Christmas. Oh, oh, they've gone to the reef. <laughs> Even the kangaroos. Even the kangaroos is chilling out. Oh, right. 
I'm going to talk to you about where I came from. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm one of the few people in Australia who didn't grow up within an hour's drive of the beach. But you can see we've got, it's like Sydney, we've got nice shopping. <laughs> a good transport, that's a railway station. <laughs> this, is, this is a hotel, it's the Coolabar Hilton. You can't, I don't know if you can read that. <laughs> uh, good sporting facilities, that's a cricket pitch. <laughs> and good housing. Oh, and I forgot the gardens and lawns. <laughs> so the, the wetlands I want to talk about is not far from here. And uh, I don't have a ranger Jenny uniform. I have to substitute. So this man will introduce these wetlands called the Macquarie Marshes. G'day. It's a typical summer's day in Australia. It's about 42 degrees, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's stinking hot. I'm right up in the northwest corner of New South Wales, right at the junction of the Barwon and the Macquarie River. On my left, coming in behind me, is the Macquarie River, and on the right, we've got the bigger Barwon River. Now, the Macquarie is like many rivers in Australia, it runs inland, it doesn't run to the sea. It starts all right up in the western side of the Blue Mountains, the Great Divide, the other side of Bathurst from here. Runs down northwest through Bathurst, down under the plains near Wellington, out to Dubbo, coming northwest to Warren, and further north from there it runs into an area called the Macquarie Marshes. We go through these marshes in a series of channels for about 50 or 60 kilometres. Then on the northern side of the marshes it forms up into this little Macquarie River and runs right out just here. Yeah, he, he has a plan to spend a month canoeing up the marshes, um, but it, it doesn't quite work out. Whoops. to the reed beds a couple of times and then there's actually not enough water to canoe all the way and then he just puts the canoes in his ute and drives the rest of the way. <coughs> Are there bird lovers, bird watchers here? What's this talk about, Roger? <laughs> um, <coughs> about five years ago, I was, I was at the marshes and I was in a, like this old former sheep paddock. It was really clapped out really bad. And I was talking to a national parks officer. And I told him that marshes were going to be part of the, of the thesis in our book. Uh, it would be one chapter. And he put his hand on his hip and he looked around and he said, no, this place isn't romantic enough to write a book about. He said, books need great lakes and mountains and forests. And he said, this place is too degraded, too flat. And um, this might have been his personal view, but I just took it as, a, as advice about what kind of nature gets attention and resources. But not far from us, a white four-wheel drive kicked up all this dust on a scald and there was a, you know, a line of, of dead eucalypt trees that had been ring-marked. And uh, 
and there was nothing on the ground, no grass, just this spiny shrub called Roly Poly. And I thought, the parks man might be right. <laughs> In his book, The River, Australian writer and farmer Eric Rolls shares a story about introducing his first wife, Joan, to the Namoi River. It was the middle of summer, and the river was losing an inch of water a day. And Joan wasn't impressed with what was before her. But Rolls said, if Joan thought it was a toad, it was no use me trying to argue the warts off it. She had to see it differently for herself. And before long, Joan must have seen it differently because they made love on the banks of the river. And that might have been Eric's method of persuasion, I don't know. But that didn't seem like an option available to me with the National Parks man. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, so how could I get across that a, a plain isn't boring or, or that, a, that a broken landscape is still worth paying attention to, caring about or knowing or renewing? The American nature writer Barbara Kingsolver says iconic places such as the Amazon rainforest or the Arctic tundra have a power that speaks for itself, that seems to throw its own grandeur as a curse on the defiler. She wonders who would complain if someone muddied her own Horselick Creek in Jackson County, a place she says there's nobody's idea of wilderness. So how do you write or tell stories about broken places, about places we'd rather turn away from? And what happens when your place isn't regarded as beautiful or iconic, if it doesn't look like this, but more like this? As you can imagine, a wetlands in dry country is unusual. It's where birds from all across Australia and all around the world come and breed after the, if, there's a river, if the river flows and there's a flood. They, um, it's like a, a boom and bust cycle of breeding. And it's a place where Aboriginal people from all around this area came and met for borer ceremonies, initiation ceremonies, and where the Wailwam people fought and died to protect their land. And these marshes were so special that in the summer of 1944, the Premier of New South Wales, William McKell, toured the marshes on horseback. He breathed the humid air as reeds rustled and cracked against the weight of his horse. He emerged from rushes to find open water lagoons, teeming with herons, spoonbills, pelicans and ducks, all feasting on 30 different species of fish. And Mikel is remembered now as an environmental hero. He created the, created the Department of Conservation and we have an award named in his honour. During this trip, he declared the marshes were of interest to scientists of world renown, and that they were a vital sanctuary for Australian and Northern Hemisphere bird life. The marshes, he said, were to be preserved for the Australian people for posterity for, posterity for all time. And I'm going to show a little video of the little film of the marshes shot in 1948. And it's very rare footage. Eggs of 
the ibis resemble those of a hen, but they have no yolk. They lie in twos, threes, and fours in reed nests. And here is a young ibis, funny looking fellow, taking his first look at a funny looking world. More and more birds go up to join those already in the air. Swamps take on new beauty with the reflection of ibis in flight. The beating of wings grows. So it's, it's an amazing abundance, so much life. I want you to think about those images you saw and the swelling music. And, and I'll show you the marshes as I've seen them. That's science with Macquarie Marshes Nature Reserve. So, what happened here? Well, after visiting the marshes, McKell went back to Sydney and announced a dam building and irrigation scheme at the head of this river and about half a dozen other rivers across the basin. And the silence at the marshes today speak to the failure of natural resource management for mediating conflicting values and interests. It's the consequences of our ecological metaphors and a long history of separating production from, protect, from protection and the failure of the idea that putting a fence around something protects it. We can't go any, into this today, there isn't enough time. I want to talk about what happened after. You have to buy the book to find out <laughs> what happened. Um, so, in those decades after, pastoral landholders, graziers, downstream blamed irrigators for the loss of the river flows, for the degra degradation of the marshes, and the irrigators blamed the pastoralists. And instead of working together to do something about the problems there, they fought. They really hated each other. You, they still had that sense when I was talk, talking to them. And while they fought in a very emotional and public debate, the reed beds disappeared, trees died, soil blew away and the birds left. A lot of them felt their whole sense of place was under attack. But there are ways of working with broken environments that, to make them feel home again. And, from the late 1970s, governments agreed we should really do something about the rivers. But it was easy just to let it slide and no one did anything and more governments said we should do something about what happened to the rivers. This is sort of like the slow violence of river management. It unfolds gradually and out of sight of most people. It's easy. It's not urgent. But eventually in the, in the early 2000s, here at the Marshes National Parks Office has spent spent a few years cultivating relationships with private landholders because 90% of the marshes are privately owned. And one landholder of the marshes made an agreement with National Parks to destock a section of his property, a, pro a part that was still in really good condition, and uh, have it listed on the, on the Ramsar database. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Ramsar, uh, protected sites for internationally migrating birds. This is photos of his property.
and the, the ibis are back <laughs> there. Uh, it meant he could get a small environmental water allocation, but to get to the Ramsar site on his property, he had to go across the rest of his property. So it was, it was good for him, good for his cattle, but also good for the birds. Now this was a, a nice government and private landholder partnership, but these small actions on a few individual properties were not enough. A few good case studies does not make a whole ecosystem. The water was still over allocated. The rivers were still in decline. And this was bad for everyone. Now here at the Rachel Carson Centre, or the fellows have been talking about the problem with trying to say that we need to care about the environment, because it hasn't really worked, and the, need, and the need for government regulation over individual action. And I'm absolutely for a collective, social, big system style change, but what I was thinking about what, what people were saying, it was, and I was agreeing, I thought about what happened here in the last decade or so. In 2007, after years of a really terrible drought and after years of the national parks people building relationships with landholders and community art projects about the rivers and projects with school children which was also a way of speaking to the parents about the importance of rivers a conservative federal government said we need a big intervention we need an ecological plan for the rivers that's not going to stop at state boundaries and just before it lost office, it announced $13 billion in funding to <coughs> buy back some of the water that had been over-allocated. And by the time the details of this plan were released in 2010, a new progressive government was in power, but something had gone wrong. The federal government bureaucracy had no experience dealing with landholders, because it was always a state responsibility. It hired project managers who got rid of all the community, community programs, community engagement, the art, art projects, and just had this top-down plan that said, in this, this river valley you're going to lose 30% of your water, on this river you're going to lose 20%. And ecologically, this is what the, all the scientists had recommended, the experts said, this well, it was actually less than what the experts re recommended, but it was a disaster. All the conflict of the past arose again, and suddenly this very, very small moment of consensus evaporated. So irrigators burnt copies of the report. People in irrigation towns started to protest, and they declared war on the, on the government authority charged with doing this task and, and on environmentalists. And the Conservative Party, sensing a political opportunity here, said if it was re-elected, it would slash the amount of water that it would buy back. This was their own creation, but now they're opposing it. And since then, state governments have fallen to Conservative governments, and they have, they have slashed their uh, funding contributions to this project. And uh, the f now new federal Conservative government has slowed down water buybacks and is using the budget to subsidise irrigation infrastructure. So we need big government intervention. You, you need that $13 billion. You need all the experts rather than individual action. But we also need a public that cares. I don't know else how you maintain or how you safeguard a big reform from from the political opportunities that present themselves if, if, if people don't really care, if that consensus is gone. And in the environmental humanities, and as environmentalists, we need to think about conne connections between people and how we treat each other, not just how we treat the land. How do we do that? I've got a very, very small scale example. An artist living in a small cotton irrigation town invited people to come down to the river and write stories on, on lantern lenses that would, he would float down the river in this, in this little ceremony.
the art project itself, uh, it was mainly a, an excuse. It was a whole day event where townsfolk, irrigators, traditional owners, pastoralists all came together in this sort of relaxed way, all talking about the river rather than threatening to shoot each other or lock each other out, that sort of thing. And it brought people together to reflect on their shared connections and values for the river. And there's talk it might become an annual event. So children will grow up thinking about these things and talking to, you know, talking to other, the neighbours and so forth. And it doesn't address the injustice of, injustice of what happened to Aboriginal people when they had their water taken away, or to the pastoralists when their water was given to the irrigators, or the irrigators who are now facing restructure. But it, it sort of helps build a foundation based on mutual interests in which conversation is sort of possible. And then more government action can occur. And one of the volunteers on the day said, from this day on, we are all river people. Not pastoralists or irrigators or whitefellas or blackfellas, but river people. Now, why does any of this matter? Why does broken country matter? And uh, Nicole won't like this because it's getting very earnest. <laughs> Uh, but sites of agricultural production are the world's shadow places. Rural heartlands provide for our material demands and our biological nourishment. Yet few of us know much about them or even want to think about them. The Australian eco-feminist philosopher Val Plumwood drew attention to a flaw in the way that many environmental writers were advocating for love of a special place as a way of preserving ecological integrity. The enjoyment of our homes, the privileged places such as the big nature reserves all around Sydney or the, or the English Garden here, are possible by sacrificing rural lands to the disorder of industrial agriculture. Shadow places are out of sight, out of mind and easier to discount. Outsourcing accountability to the shadow places transfers the burden to other people, often the most vulnerable, and to future generations. Agriculture has been the primary cause of species loss and continues to be perhaps the greatest threat to biodiversity. Agriculture has played a significant role in plunging the earth into another mass extinction event, sixth in its history. Farming allowed humans to break billion-year-old biological rules that no other species had managed to do. We divorced ourselves from the confines of local ecosystems. We became economic entities in our own right. And we have become the equivalent of a geological force. There's no model for this. What we saw at the marshes is happening in lots of places all around the world. These are the places that feed us, that grow us. And it is perhaps the broken places, places we want to turn away from, that are most in need of attention. So my job, I, I try to write the inland, inland plains as they are, I don't try to argue the warts off them. But like, like I guess all of us, we're trying to, find, trying to find a way to write about them that is in some way useful. It's, I don't know how to do that, I'm still working out how to do that. I think I should stop there. <laughs>